If you have God's book, I would invite you to open up with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. That's going to be the chapter that we're going to study tonight, and I'll be with you here in, in just a few moments. I do beseech you to pray on behalf of, of my wife and, and my son. They're going to be traveling this week. They're going to be in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and so I pray that you'll, you'll keep them in your prayers and that they may return home safely and back into my arms. This evening, I came to talk to you about grace. Where do you begin? Where do you go? Where do you finish? I mean, all together, it's all about grace, is it not? You think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10 when he says, By grace I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and, and so you believe. When you think about Paul, you realize that Paul taught what he taught about God through grace, he was what he was by grace, he lived the way that he lived by grace. One day he died by grace and it was because he was saved and he was justified by grace. What if I were to ask you the question, how long would you stay at a church that never talked about salvation? How long would you stay at a church that never talked about baptism for the remission of sins? How long would you stay at a church that never talked about the work of the church, never talked about partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, never talked about the collection of the saints? How long would you stay at a church that never talked about those things? And I would dare say that your answer would be we would not stay there at all because those are things that are biblically important, biblically sound. How long would you stay at a church that never talked about grace? You know, there's many people who have spent many years in many congregations that never talk about grace because they don't appreciate grace, nor do they understand the grace of God. You realize that you and I cannot even talk about the most important subject in all of the Bible, the reason that the Bible was brought to us without talking about grace. And that topic was salvation. Forever etched in the pages of all eternity are the words that we find in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8, our scripture that we're going to study. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship, that means we are His creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, sometimes as members of the Church of Christ, people come up to us and they say, what do you all believe about grace? Do you believe that we're saved by grace? And if you do, how are we saved by grace? We have a tendency to use more caveats than a timeshare salesman in trying to explain to them how we're saved by grace. We should never apologize for the grace of God. We should never be ashamed of the grace of God. It's not a topic to be avoided. It's a topic to be promoted. It's a topic to be discussed. It's a topic to be preached. If I were to ask you the question, what is your definition of grace? What would you say? Well, you may give me the common definition that everyone gives, and that is unmerited favor. Grace is unmerited favor. You know, throughout the Bible, the word grace, cheris in the original Greek, is found 150 to 160 times based upon the translation that you use. Eleven of those times, the word grace means kindness. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. That even while I was dead in my trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Is it possible that you and I could substitute the word kindness in for the word grace? By kindness, by God's kindness, we have been saved. See, grace is a part of my salvation, but grace is also a part of what I say. It's a part of my speech. In Luke chapter 4 to verse 22, you remember what they said about Jesus? So all bore witness to him, and they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not the son of Joseph? Jesus had an amazing way of communicating with people in a kind way. The grace of God was evident and embodied in the way that he spoke. The joy and the kindness of God was embodied in the way that he spoke. So why do we as Christians, sometimes we're hateful. Sometimes we speak to people in hateful ways. That's not how Jesus did it. 
You know, the grace of God is how I pray. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 30, but if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Isn't it interesting that the word thanks is cheris? It's grace. So when we say prayer, we're saying grace over the food that we're about to eat. But grace is also something that I stand within. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12. Peter said, By Silvanius, our faithful follower, brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. You know, by saying there's a true grace of God, by implication that means there's also a false grace of God. Is it true that there are people that have a false understanding, a misunderstanding of the grace of God? Peter says we don't stand in the false grace of God. But sometimes we as Christians talk about grace in a way that we wouldn't know whether we believe it or not. We stand in the true grace of our God. Could it be possible that instead of singing the song Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me that we could replace the word grace with kindness? Amazing kindness, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When we get ready to pray over our food, we don't have to say prayer, we say grace. We give thanks for the food that God has has given us. You see, I live by grace, I'm saved by grace, I speak by grace, I stand in the true grace of God, I give thanks, I give grace because I'm saved by grace, I'm justified by grace through faith. It's what Paul's prose to the letter in the letter of Ephesians is. He's talking about the grace of God. If you look at the book of Ephesians and you were to take the book of Ephesians and you literally were to take the book and squeeze it and wring it out, You know what would splatter everywhere? Grace. Grace would go all over the place because that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about the plot of grace. How God, before the foundation of the earth, prepared to save a body of people in Christ Jesus that would be the church. The church which Christ is the Savior of, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. In Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul talks about the past. He talks about our past. He says, here's your resume. We're not born into sin, but we have something that's worse. By virtue of long practice, we have become very good at sinning. He says, this is where you were. You were sinners in your past. Your resume is not something that you could bring to God and say, I deserve to go to heaven. In verses 4 through 8, or 5 through 7, rather, he talks about the plan of grace. So this is what I'm going to do. Jesus saved us, Jesus raised us, and he seated us in the heavenly places so that we could feel the exceeding joy and the exceeding kindness that God has bestowed upon us, though we do not deserve it, to stand saved and justified in the eyes of God. And then in verses 8 through 10, he talks about the purpose of grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God wanted us to know that it's him that saves us, it's not man. And therefore, because God saves and man doesn't save, it is our job to go and tell about the greatness, the goodness, the grace, the kindness of our God. When you talk about grace, we realize that our belief comes through grace. You remember a man by the name of Apollos? Here was a man who was mighty in words. He was a mighty preacher, but Aquila and Priscilla are listening to him. And they understand that he only understands the baptism of John, and so they pull him aside and they teach him the way of God more accurately. Well, he departs from then, and then he goes down to Corinth, and while he's there, he greatly helped those, here it is, who had believed, Through grace. Jesus died by grace. The Spirit revealed the Word of God by grace. And whoever brought the gospel to you, whoever taught the gospel to you, did so by grace. Through grace we have believed. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I think about Acts chapter 11, the church at Antioch. Repentance. Repentance. 
Here you have the story of Peter. He's really telling all these things that happened with Cornelius. And, and as he's there in Antioch, he says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God and they said, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to the life. What's well, a grant? It's different than a loan, right? A loan is something that you take out, something that you should pay back, or at least you should pay it back. Only about 30% of people pay their loans back. But it's a loan, it's a, it's a thing that you should pay back. It's the money that you should give back over time. But what's a grant? A grant isn't a loan. A grant is something that's free. A grant is a free gift. A grant is something that you did nothing to merit, yet it is given to you. Now, there might be requirements for you to receive that grant, but the requirements of that grant do not merit the grant. He says that repentance is a grant. It's not something that we deserve, but we have to do it. It's God giving us the ability, giving us the opportunity to turn away from our sins, to turn away from Satan and being children of the devil becoming children of God. He's giving us the opportunity. He's given us the ability to be saved from our sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, repentance leading unto salvation, not to be regretted. Now we're talking about grace up here, right? Well, let's get grace down to where the rubber hits the road. Let's get grace out of this pulpit. Let's get what we're saying in this pulpit out into the community. Let's live it. Let's teach it. Let's show it to other people. So here's the question. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. What am I saved from? By grace, what have I been saved from? Well, by grace, I have been saved from sin. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. He says that we are saved by grace through faith. Notice that God does not say you have been saved by grace alone. We're saved by grace through faith. Did you know that every single time that the Bible speaks about faith in the New Testament... Faith always has legs. You know what that means? It's always doing something. It's always doing what God has commanded it to do. It's always going about. It's cooperating through works with the grace of God. Faith has legs. Faith can move. Faith is not standing still doing absolutely nothing. And Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace does not remove obedience. Grace re promotes obedience. Because if my salvation was purely based upon my works, we would try to make a contractual agreement with God and we would say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to go a step further and you're going to save me. But if my salvation is in fact based upon a grace through faith system, that means that I'm going to do whatever God has told me to do because I trust in God. And there seems to be two extremes when you're talking about grace. The first extreme would be this. I'm going to work to the bone. I'm going to do everything that I can do. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to stay longer. I'm going to arrive earlier. I'm going to do all the evangelism work. I'm going to do all the work of the church. I'll do it by myself. I'm going to work, work, work to the bone until God loves me. But you'll fall under the weight of the own idol that you have created in your life because that's not the God that we read of in the New Testament. But then you have the other extreme. I'm not going to do anything. Salvation's purely a grace thing and therefore there's no requirements of me. I can live the way that I want to live. I can do what I want to do. I don't have to work harder. I don't have to stay longer. I don't have to arrive earlier. I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to do nothing. But that person is going to fall under the weight of their own apathy. Because one day God's going to look at you and he's going to say, I showed you grace. Where was your faith? Paul says you can't miss this. You can't miss it. You have to get it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Paul would later say in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, I love this verse. Verse. 
He says, but when the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. In other words, we didn't deserve that. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I want you to notice with me something. I want you to underline a few words. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, this is what Paul says saved us. He says, the kindness, the love of God, our Savior, His mercy saved us through the washing of regeneration. There's baptism. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say in John chapter 3 and verse 5? Unless a man be born again of the water and of the Spirit, he shall by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. And thus we have been justified. The word justified means just if I'd never sinned by his grace. Baptism is the pipe through which the grace of God comes. Now I don't know about you, but I want a drink of God's grace. I want to drink freely of the grace of God and baptism is the pipe through which that grace is going to come to me. But when I get a drink of the grace of God, when I drink of that water, who am I going to give the credit to? Am I going to give the credit to the water or am I going to give the credit to the pipe? Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone, any man should boast. I'm saved by grace through faith. But by grace, I'm also saved from the penalty of sin. I mean, that's the whole book of Romans, right? From Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. All the way over to Romans chapter 16 and to verse 24 when Paul also talks about grace. And what he's saying is this. You are released from the penalty of sin. And perhaps no verse makes that more clear than Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 starting in verse 6. That should be Romans chapter 4 starting in verse 6, not Titus chapter 3, 3 through 4. That's a human error. In Romans chapter 6, or Romans chapter 4 rather, starting in verse 6, Paul says, just as David also describes... Now wait a second. David lived more than a thousand years before the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to the church at Rome. And he talks about David in the present tense. He says, David is somewhere, David is saved. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. This evening I'm in front of a group of individuals that shall never have another sin reckoned to them. Why? Because of faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So discussion is not, does faith alone save me? The discussion is, what kind of faith is it that saves alone? And we all say, and we all know this, the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. If I am committed, if I am faithful to Christ, if I bear my entire weight of my life upon the foundation, the rock of ages... I shall stand before God and no sin shall be reckoned to me. Do you believe this? There's something terribly wrong about the best of us and there is something terribly right about the worst of us. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not everything that I desire to be. I'm not everything that God's Word wants me to be. But by the grace of God, I'm no longer what I used to be. Now, I'm justified, sanctified in the sight of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're familiar with the first verse, but are you familiar with the second verse? 
For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We talk about it all the time, but what's the second verse? Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word justified could be said that it means just if I never sinned. The word freely means it's nothing that I have done on my part. The word grace means He paid the price. And the word redemption means he bought me back. He redeemed me. And not only did the price that he paid buy me out of the sinful prison that I was in, it brought me into my Lord's house and I was restored as a child of God. I was snatched from the prison and I was seated in the palace. I'm not what... I ought to be. I'm not everything that God's Word desires me to be. I'm trying. Every single day I'm trying. But thank you, Lord, because I'm not what I used to be. And I've been saved from the penalty of sin. For the wages of sin is death. But, but, The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. By grace, I am saved from the practice of sin. I'm not saying that I don't sin. I'm not saying that I do not commit sin. I still sin just as you sin. Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what I'm saying now is this. I do not practice darkness. I practice righteousness. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It's a verse that we need to remember. It's a verse that you need to memorize. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You know what that means? That means when I sin, I can't blame my parents That means when I sin, I can't blame my grandparents. That means when I sin, I can't blame my friends. That means when I sin, I can't blame those that are around me and in my circle. When I sin, it's my fault. Because God says, I've made it possible for you that no temptation would ever overtake you. I'm going to give you a way of escape. I'm going to give you an out. Imagine being in a tough situation, not knowing what to do, and God comes to you and He says, I'm going to give you a way out. That's what He said. So, every time I sin, it's my fault. I can never say the devil made me do it. I can never say it was beyond my ability to to withstand it. All I can say when I sin is this. I forgot about my salvation And I forgot about the grace of God that God has shown me. I'm saved from the propensity of sin. Before I became a Christian, I was good at sin. You were too. I would see the good and I would do the bad. I would sit down to do good. Sin would enter into my mind and what would I do? I'd get up and go do the sin. But now I'd like to think that as a Christian, as a child of God, as one who's born again, that I'd sit down... Perhaps with sin on my mind. But then good would enter into my mind and I would get up, not do the sin, and go do the good. Because God has saved me. I'm saved by His grace through faith. Has that transformation occurred in your life? What about Romans 8 verse 1? Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. When I'm saved by His grace, I have a new state and I have a new status without condemnation. If a person is in Christ, if they're living by the Spirit, Paul says, you can write across their forehead no kind of condemnation. Not the devil, not your brethren, and not you. And even if your heart harbors ill will towards you, John says that God is greater than your heart, 1 John 3, verse 20. God says when you think about sinning, when you think about going back to the practice of sin, He says, are you ever going to grow up? 
Are you ever going to realize the relationship that I now share with you? God says, I want you. But you've got to take that step. I think about Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. One of the great blessings that we have as Christians. Prayer. And what it says. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be, be uttered. I don't know how to pray. I think that I do. I try to the best of my ability to pray to God. I try to the best of my ability to express the things that are on my heart, on my shoulders, on my mind to my God. I know that he hears my prayers. I know that he answers them according to his will. I know that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I know that God hears my prayers. But I grunt and I groan. The Spirit says, Father, if he had the ability to pray, this is what he would be saying. God the Father says, I knew it all along because I know his heart. And Jesus the Son says, Father, will you please answer that prayer? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I suppose that if you took away the cross, if you filled the tomb, if you emptied the throne, if you shut the mouth of Jesus, I suppose then, then, you could condemn me. But I'm saved from the practice of sin. I no longer practice darknesses. I no longer practice sinfulness. I practice righteousness. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to sin. I will sin. You will sin. But isn't it beautiful that when we sin, we can confess our trespasses to Him and He is faithful enough to forgive us because we had that avenue of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And I want you to read a verse with me and probably the most famous, familiar parable in the entire world. In Luke chapter 15, we had the parable of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son has gone into a life of prodigal living. He's in the pig pen. He's wallowing around with the swine. He smells the bread of home and he says, My father had enough bread to spare in his house. And so he comes to his father and he prepares this speech. He says, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. But verse 20 says, And Annie arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion. And he ran, and he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. The father had compassion. The son had gone into a sinful life. The son had done things unspeakable. His brother knew about him. The son was in the pig pen wallowing around because he had squandered his inheritance. And when he wanted to come home, his father not only welcomed him, he met him. He greeted him while he was still a far way off. It's grace. God has said, here is what I'm willing to give you. And we say, well, I just don't know if I'm ready, God. I just don't know if, I, if I'm ready to live that life. I just don't know if I can put these things away. I mean, I like the life that I live. God says, this is what I'm going to give you. Well, God, I just, I don't know. Can I wait till I get older? Can I wait till I get more wiser? Can't I wait till I get stronger? God says, this is what I'm going to give you. Why not take what God has given us? He's given us an opportunity. He's given us the ability to become those. As Paul would say in Ephesians 2 and in verse 8, that have been saved by grace 
through faith. If you're here this evening and you're not a New Testament Christian, the grace of God comes through the pipe of baptism. If you want to drink of the grace of God, the kindness that He has bestowed upon you, though you have never done anything to merit that kindness, you've never done anything to earn that kindness, God has said, here's the requirements. Meet the requirements and you shall receive this free gift. And it's extended to all. It doesn't matter where you come from financially. It doesn't matter where you come from socially. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what you're doing in your present. All that matters is this, that you're willing to make God your future. Are you willing to make Him your future? He says, here's what I want to offer you. For the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Why have you not taken that gift? Maybe you are here, but you need prayers. You think about all the things that you've done in your life, and maybe you became a Christian and you entered right back into a life of sin, and you forgot about your salvation. You forgot about the grace that God showed you, and you want to make things right. Why don't you come forward? The family of God will embrace you and pray for you.